I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is where we're going to be today as we continue our study, Just Jesus. We've been spending the year walking through the Gospel of Luke, uh, looking at Jesus, his stories, his interactions with people, what he's teaching, so that we can learn how to be more like Jesus. And today we're going to be in Luke chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the ones in the seats around you. They look like this. Turn to page 1035, and you will find Luke chapter 12. Uh, also, if you are in a place in your life where you want to read the Bible and you don't have one, then please take one of these with you. This is our gift to you. Because uh, we know that if you read God's Word and you follow God's Word, it's going to change your life. So uh, that's just what we offer to anyone who comes here. If you need a Bible, then take one. Uh, you know, I, I just confess that I hate doing stupid things. You know, I don't know if you're like me, but I hate being a moron. I hate it when I have those, Chad, you're an idiot moments. I hate being foolish. Anybody else with me? You hate, do you hate that? Yeah, I don't think anybody really wants to be uh, a fool, uh, but uh, golly, I'm so good at it. You know, and I wrote those words down, and, and I thought of this incident that happened years ago. Uh, it just, just kind of illustrates how good I am at foolishness sometimes. Uh, we were on like one of the first big mission trips I ever led with a bunch of students, and, and we're having a great time. We're up on, in Washington State, right on the coast, and uh, we're doing vacation Bible school with this little church and doing community outreach things, and it was the first night there. Got all the kids situated. They were in their homes. We were driving to our home, Meralda and I, in the church van, and I'd noticed something really intriguing of, about this area. They kept having all these signs that said, the beach is a public highway. The beach is a public highway, so just be careful. And I'm like, hey, let's go driving on the beach. What a great idea, right? We're in a church van. How cool that would be, just driving along the beach. And Meralda says, no, you'll get stuck. I go, no, it's a, it's a highway. They have these signs that say it's a public highway. So let's go driving on the beach. She says, no, you'll get stuck. And, of course, I didn't listen to her, and we went driving on the beach, and guess what happened? I got stuck. I buried that thing up to the axles in sand. Had to get a special kind of tow truck to pull us out, you know, four-wheel drive and everything. Uh, because I was an idiot. And there was no recovering from that that moment. Because here we were. We hadn't been married that long. And, um, and guys, she was right. 100% right. And I was a fool. And, and uh, I'm just, I hate that. I hate that. And that's one of the reasons I, I really want people to read the Bible, because the Bible, one of the themes in it is to instruct us on how to avoid being idiots. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there's an entire book in the Old Testament called the Book of Proverbs, where the whole purpose of it, it was, it was written by a father trying to teach his sons how not to live their life as morons. Okay? He wanted them to be wise, and so he wrote this book. And, and by the way, if you've ever said the Bible's just really hard to understand, then I want to challenge you to read Proverbs. Because Proverbs is much more like somebody with a two-by-four just hitting you upside the head saying, do you get it now? Do you get it now? Don't do this. Do this. It's practical. It's wisdom. And so if we don't want to be foolish, we want to learn from Proverbs. But it doesn't stop in Proverbs. Throughout Scripture, there are places where it's trying to say, hey, this is what a wise life is looks like. And Jesus does that in his teachings over and over and over again. And today we're going to be looking at one of those stories that Jesus tells, which we know it's about how to be wise because it's titled The Parable of the Rich Fool. So he's like telling us a story about someone that we don't want to emulate. So let's read this. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. It says, Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, 
You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The passage, the conversation begins with the request. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. That's how it starts. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Some things never change, do they? Families fight about money, especially at the death of parents. And this man wanted his cut of the property. Now, we need to understand the culture of that day, how things worked in Israel at that time, uh, because property was their main uh, you know, measure of, of wealth. They, they, uh, they had property, and it was, the family wanted to keep the property. They very rarely sold it. So that's what you pass down from generation to generation as a, as a farming culture, very agrarian. So they're going to need that land to raise the crops and raise the animals on. And so when the, the dad died, the oldest son inherited the property, all of it. And the younger siblings could live there and live off the land, but they lived under the authority of their oldest brother, who was now the patriarch of the family. Now, how many of you in this room are firstborns or only children? Yeah. All you firstborns, you don't see a problem with this, do you? You think, hey, that's, that's a good system. They should institute that today again, right? Now, how many of you are younger siblings in here? Yeah. Do you guys like this? Do you like that system? Do you, want your, do you want to live under the authority of your older brothers and sisters? Any of you? Yeah, no. See, I'm the third out of four, and I hate that idea. I would not want to live under the authority of my oldest brother. And maybe he'll listen to this and then beat me up. Uh, because, you know, that still happens. Uh, it's kind of how it is. You see... Uh, he wants it all to be changed. He wants it all to be different. And he asked Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Maybe we should hear it the way that I think it was probably a little more accurately described. Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus is annoyed by this request. He's annoyed by the request. And we can tell this by his response. And, and by the way, if you ever wonder whether or not Jesus was sarcastic, here might be the first argument for it. Because he says what to this man as his response. It's right there in verse 15 uh, or 14. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? Now Jesus says, who appointed me to be the judge over this situation? Um, maybe God? Think about it. Jesus is perfect. He's sinless. He is righteous. He is the one that every one of us is going to give an account to for our lives. In other words, Jesus is the one that God has appointed to judge the living and the dead. He is the one that Scripture says is the one lawgiver and one judge, the man Jesus Christ. There is no one else who is more qualified to be the judge over anything other than Jesus. And Jesus said, who put me in charge? It's at least ironic, but I think Jesus was smiling when he said that, although he had probably uh, a little bit frustrated over the whole situation. So why is Jesus annoyed? Well, because God hates it when families divide over money. God hates it when families divide over money. God created families to bless, to protect, to encourage, to help, to nurture. Not to fight over who gets what. By the way, just because it, it starts off with this whole request about inheritance and families fighting over money, this is another reason that, that you really ought to have a will or an estate plan to take care of your stuff when you're gone so that your family doesn't fight over your stuff. Now, you might go, well, I don't care. I'm not going to be there. 
But if you love your kids, you ought to go ahead and have a plan so that they don't fight over it. And if they're going to get mad at anybody because you gave something to someone else, then they ought to get mad at you because you're not there anymore. You're in heaven and you don't care. I mean, think about how selfish it is if you say, well, I don't want them to be mad at me because I didn't give. No, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Do what's right. You know, bless your kids. Bless God. And, 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 don't, and that way they don't fight over it later on. What a gift to give to your family. And some of you are saying, oh, I'm young and, I, and we don't have any money. We just got kids. Great. Then you need to make sure that no one's fighting for your kids. You need to have a plan in place to bless them. Because God hates it when families divide over money. I just, I've seen too many families torn apart at a time of, of death because they were greedy. They wanted stuff. So I've just personally made a commitment to God to never fight over an inheritance. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it. I'll trust God to take care of me. So this is annoying to Jesus because, well, God hates it when families divide over money. And secondly, because Jesus knows this isn't about fairness. He knows that's not the issue. Jesus understands that there's an underlying issue at work, and so he gives the warning. Be on your guard against covetousness. That's verse 15. Just listen to him again. And he said to them, to all of us, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In other words, know what is important. Know what's valuable. You see, Jesus understands that this man wants what he doesn't have. I want my share. I want my portion. I want what's fair. And Jesus hears that and says to everyone else who's listening, guard your heart from coveting. Why? Why do we need to guard our hearts from coveting? Because coveting destroys relationships and steals our joy. See, if you want a life that is filled with broken relationships all around you, if you want a life of misery, then go ahead and covet all you want. Just focus on all the stuff that other people have that you wish you had, that you think you deserve, and your life will be miserable. You see, coveting makes us foolish. Foolish. Think about it. Here's the dynamic that happens in our lives when we covet. Instead of enjoying the blessings of God, instead of thanking God for His goodness, His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, all those things that we enjoy, we're focusing on the things that we don't have and that we want. So we miss out on enjoying the blessings of God because we're focused on what we don't possess. And coveting convinces us that life is about possessions. It's about things. It's about stuff. It's about having. And if we get the right stuff, if we have more things, if we get what we want, then somehow we're going to have joy. And that's a lie from the pits of hell. That's not going to happen. Getting stuff is not going to make you happy. So Jesus warns us not to be fools and to pursue that path. To know what's important. So do you know what's important? Do you know what is important? Do you, and, you, and here, let me just clarify. Do you know what's important to you? Have you clarified in your life the things that are really ultimately important? Now, I know that I could walk off the stage with a, a microphone in hand and go out and quiz every one of you in this room, and you are smart enough to pass the test. You could give the correct answer. You could give the church answer and, and say, oh, yeah, I know the things are important. But see, giving the correct answer isn't really what's necessary. Living the correct answer is what really matters. See, if we can all speak the right answer, that doesn't matter. But if we live the right answer, it does make a difference. So are you living a wise or a foolish life according to Jesus' warning? Um, I kind of pray that that's a question that haunts you all week long. Are you living a wise life or a foolish life? Now, to help answer that, Jesus tells the story. Let me read the story again that he tells because he wants us to guard our hearts against coveting. Look at verse 16 and following. And Jesus told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. 
And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's walk through this story and that'll help us evaluate really whether we're living a, a wise life or a foolish life. First of all, notice the problem. They had abundant blessings. He had abundant blessings. He had too much food. His land produced plentifully, and he had all this food, and his barns weren't big enough. Oh, how terrible. Now, just stop for a minute. We're listening to this, and it's just a story. And, and it, they're like, okay, he's got too much food. He tears, he's got barns. He tears down barns. Okay, I get that. The people listening to Jesus were in a completely different place than us. They were hungry. They were hungry. These were people who were subsistence farmers, who were living day to day, who were always just that far away from starvation. They were living on the edge because they knew, hey, if, if there was a, a famine, if there was a drought, they were going to starve. If they got injured and weren't able to work, their family was going to go hungry. And they're listening to the problem of this guy having too much, and he's like, oh, what am I going to do? And, and they're thinking, hey, maybe you could sell the grain, and because if there's too much grain, the prices will go down, and we can afford to buy more for our family. Or maybe you could just help some people who are hungry. Nope. He just built bigger barns. You see, we have the same problem. And I'm not talking about too much food, although that is a problem because we do have too much food. We might be the first society in the history of the world that literally is killing ourselves because we have too much food. I mean, for thousands of years it's been, do we have enough food? And now we have more than enough. But instead of building bigger barns for our food, we just eat bigger portions and buy bigger pants. That's been my strategy all along anyway. No, we have the same problem of abundant blessings. We have food. We have clothing. We have shelter. We have transportation. We have disposable income. We have education, health care, safety. We are blessed incredibly. And, and, and if you're like me, you read this story, and, and the first thought is, yeah, those rich people ought to figure out what to do with all their abundance. And we don't think of ourselves as being the rich person in the story. But here's the reality. We live in the United States of America in 2016, which means that every person in this room is in the richest 2% of people worldwide. We're in the wealthiest 2%. You say, well, I'm at the poverty line in, in the United States of America. Great. You're at the poverty line in the U.S. You know what that means? That means that you're richer than 98% of the world. You see, we don't notice that because we're too busy looking at the 1% who have more. We're like, oh, I don't have that much because I don't have as much as the 1%. Yes, but you've got more than 98% of the people in the world. Guys, we won the lottery of history. You are blessed incredibly. And, and just for the warning part of it, understand that when Jesus is telling this story, we can't really associate with the poor people. We need to be understanding that we're in the place of the rich guy. We've been blessed abundantly. So we have the problem of abundant blessings. Notice then the response, the foolish response. I'm going to build bigger barns, I'm going to save for myself, and I'm going to indulge. What's my plan? I'm going to build bigger barns. That way I can sit back and eat, drink, and be merry. I can relax. Here, let me put it another way. I can retire. That's another way that we know that we're really wealthy, because the middle class in America retires. You don't do that most other places in the world. And, and I don't know about you, but I read this guy's uh, plan, and I think, you know what? I might hire him as a retirement planner because this guy is pretty smart. He's got a plan, and he's going to be able to sit back and enjoy life. I isn't that what we all want to do? Don't we all want to work hard and get to that place where we can sit back and enjoy life? Isn't that kind of the American dream we're all aiming for? We're all 
heading for. I mean, I read this uh, from a secular viewpoint. I think this guy is a brilliant businessman. He's going to make a lot of money. He's going to sit back and he's going to enjoy the fruit of his labor. That is awesome. Except for the fact that God calls him an idiot. Why? Why does God call him a fool? Because it's all about him. It's all about him. He is selfish. You see, it's not a problem having because God's the one who blesses. The question is, what do you do with those abundant blessings that you receive? It's not a problem being a great businessman and building up a business. The problem is, what do you do with it when you get it? And this man was completely and totally selfish. Did, did you notice how he referenced himself all the time in the story? Look at verses 17 through 19 again, and I'm going to read it. You try to count how many I's and my's you hear. And he said to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. 11. Three verses, 11, eyes and mys. It's all about him. His selfish life is focused on I and my, my stuff, my life, my possessions, my plans. And our culture buys into that ethic. Our culture celebrates the wealthy, the self-made millionaires and billionaires, and we laud them and we talk about them and that's what we want to be like. And, and, and we buy into our culture's values. A culture whose values God calls foolish. So let me ask this. This question, are you pursuing possessions or people? Is your life focused on pursuing possessions or are you focused on building relationships with people? Because the fool in the story was focused on acquiring stuff. It was more, more, more for me, me, me. And the challenge from the story is to examine our lives and focus on people, not possessions. So, are you pursuing strong family relationships? Because family is the first organization created by God. It's the first place of blessing. Are you blessing your spouse and your children with you, not just with things? Are, are you living at peace with your extended family? You go, yeah, but you don't know my extended family. Well, here's what Paul said in, in Romans chapter 12. He said, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, he qualifies that. There's some people who want to always have a war. The question is, are you the one who's starting the war? Are you the one who's promoting peace in your family? You see, these are the most important people that God has given to you, and He blessed you with them. Are you pursuing them, or are you taking your family for granted? Let me be really blunt. Are your kids, or excuse me, is your job more important than your children? Are you trying to provide things for your children, or are you giving them yourself? Because you can give your kids all the really cool stuff and you can enroll them in every awesome activity and you can be their chauffeur and their coach and their cheerleader and never really give them yourself. Time is the most valuable asset you have. Use it wisely because it flies. And what about your marriage? Is your marriage more valuable than your stuff or even yourself? See, your spouse is designed to be the one person that you share everything with. But I see so many couples who really only share an address and maybe offspring. You see, if you value your children more than your spouse, you're being foolish. You know, being co-parents is never an idea that Scripture promotes. Children need parents who love each other. So invest in your marriage. 
Uh, by the way, the reason we promote life groups is because we want you to connect to a life group because then you'll be surrounded by people who love God and who are growing in their faith, and they will encourage your marriage and encourage you to be stronger in that. We offer marriage studies, and, and, uh, and I know they're inconvenient, you know, and you go, oh, I have to get up earlier, I have to do this or do that. It's worth the time. Go to a marriage conference and, and build your marriage. You go, oh, that's time and money. Those are expensive, yes, but your marriage is worth it. And if you're struggling, get counseling. And, and please, don't wait until it's too late. Can I just tell you, it breaks my heart because so often people will come into counseling and it's only after it's gotten so bad they can't stand it anymore and they're really, in their mind, are just looking for a legitimate reason to leave. And that's too late most of the time. If you're struggling, then, then find someone who can help you, who can coach you, who can encourage you, who can teach you so that you can preserve your marriage. Do what it takes to make it stronger. And it's going to take effort. It's going to take energy. It's going to take time. It's going to take sometimes money. So are you living to bless your family or being a fool? See, the Christian life actually begins at home, and it's validated in our homes. Take care of it there first. And then, are you pursuing relationships with people who are far from God? You see, every one of us has been blessed by God with influence. You might not think you have influence, but there are people in your life that you come in contact with that you have influence on. So are you leading them toward Jesus? Are you helping them? Are you serving them? You see, to do this, we have to value people more than we care about money or status or, or ourselves. We have to actually say, hey, these people are important, and I want to make a difference in their life. I want to encourage them. I want to help them. It, it, it's kind of like the whole Main Street thing that we're promoting right now. You know, there's some of you that are going, yeah, I could help out on Main Street, but that's a lot of work, and it's effort, and it's playing with kids, and I have to get down on my knees, and it hurts. Uh, yeah, I'll let somebody else do it. Yes, it is effort. It's work. We're going down there. We're serving the children and families of Lake Havasu City. We're collecting candy to do that. It's just a, a picture of what we do. Anything that we do to serve is going to be a sacrifice. It, it's not going to be easy. And, and if we look at everything and go, well, I don't want to do that. It's going to be hard. We're never going to become servants. And it's going to be about us rather than about others, and we're going to live that foolish life. Look again at verse 21. I want to close with this thought. Jesus says, The fool is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The fool is the one who stores up treasure for himself. Wisdom is being rich toward God. Wisdom is loving God. It's loving your neighbor. It's investing in life change. It's tangibly giving to God's kingdom. So if someone audited your life, what would they find? What verdict would they give? If they looked at how you spent your time, what you invested your energy in, and how you spent your money, what would they say? Would they say that you're living a life that is rich toward God or is foolish? Now, here's the reality. There's no person that's going to audit your life. But Jesus is doing it today. Because he is the one who's qualified to judge. And he knows our hearts and he knows our lives. There's nothing that is hidden from him. And the day will come when we're going to give an account for our lives. And, and so the challenge is this. Evaluate your life. Where are you being wise? Where are you being foolish? Because we've already established that none of us wants to be an idiot. So we hear the warning of Jesus. Are we going to continue to walk the foolish path? Are we going to make a course correction? Because the foolish path isn't going to work. And Jesus is calling us to invest our lives in his kingdom, to invest in our marriages, in our children, in our church, to use influence that we have to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's what wisdom looks like. So what if? 
What if tonight was your last night on earth? What if tonight Jesus said, your soul is required of you? What would be the next proclamation from God? Would you hear, you fool? Or would you hear, well done, good and faithful servant? You know the best thing about grace? As long as we're breathing, we can change. We have a choice. In other words, every single one of us can walk in wisdom. Choice is yours. Which path are you going to take? Let's pray.